My name is Barbara Lee. I'm a board member of the adult school, and I'm very, very pleased to introduce Michael Barry to you. And uh, his background is absolutely amazing. I, I think you're going to be very interested. Professor Barry lectures in Princeton's Near Eastern Studies Department on the medieval and modern Islamic cultures of Iran, Pakistan, India, and most especially Afghanistan where his work over more than three decades has ranged from anthropological research to defense of human rights and coordinating humanitarian assistance for the Paris-based International Federation for Human Rights, for Médecins du Monde, and for the United Nations. He's published extensively in both French and English and holds six literary prizes from France and Iran. He is also consultative chairman to the Department of Islamic Art at New York's Metropolitan Museum of Art. Raised in France and partly in Afghanistan, Professor Barry graduated from Princeton University with a major in Near Eastern Studies and later took higher degrees in Anthropology and Islamic Studies from Cambridge University. He has a postgraduate diploma in Anthropology, McGill University in Montreal, and finally the École des Études en Sciences Sociales à Paris. He interrupted his academic career to serve as an international humanitarian worker in war-torn Afghanistan between 1979 and 2001. I would say he's dealt with things a lot more serious than the technological problems we've had tonight. Traveling in dangerous conditions and often even in disguises across the Pakistani border at the head of international relief teams to deliver urgently needed supplies of food and medicine to deprived populations deep in the Afghan interior. He successively served as Afghan Affairs Observer for the Paris-based International Federation for Human Rights, as Coordinating Officer for Médecins du Monde's clandestine field hospitals in the country under Soviet occupation, as Consultant and Humanitarian Leader in the field for the UN, and as Special Envoy to Kabul to deliver food and medicine to the starving Afghan capital during the post-Soviet civil war and under Taliban siege. He has uh, his book on a history of modern Afghanistan for Cam Cambridge University Press, summarizes in English his research of many years in the country, findings hitherto mainly available in his French language publications. But at the same time, as if that weren't enough, he's been keen to pursue his studies of earlier aspects of Islamic culture, history, literature, mysticism, art, his medievalist writings mostly dwell on the symbolism underlying much traditional Islamic art and poetry. The English version of his latest book, Figurative Art in Medieval Islam and the Riddle of Bijad of Herat, addresses and for the first time suggests how to crack the allegorical code of 15th and 16th century Persian miniatures, notably in the light of medieval mystical Persian poetry. I can't think of a more Renaissance man than this individual, and I think he's going to provide us a very, very interesting lecture. So let's welcome him. No microphone. That's it. Technological bug every way. Do you hear me with a normal voice? Yes. Then no microphone, please. No games, no toys. Just, I hope, the most conventional slides. Hopefully, they will work. Will I be heard up there? Is there a microphone actually here? Wonderful. I wanted to suggest a few opening pictures of Venice at the very end of the Middle Ages, at the end of the 15th century, just so that it would sing in your imagination what kind of city Marco Polo is leaving from to cross Asia, Asia and reach the Mongol court in Beijing. We will not be able to leave from Venice, but I assure you we will travel across Asia, and then we will go around the African landmass with the Portuguese and reach Asia another way. That's what these slides will show. So bear with me in this discovery of the world pretty much as it unfolds, like a developing negative from the middle of the 13th century to the end of the 15th. It becomes a moment where every aspect of the world knits together what had been disjointed. 
civilizations which had ignored one another, everything comes into such a nexus that nothing any longer can be separated from anywhere else. So when we, when we look at the map of the world as we know it today, we can sort of suggest a line going down the middle of the Atlantic, east of that line and west of that line, there was no connection until the end of the 15th century. There is a connection here, and there was some navigation in the Pacific, but here you have a true disconnect. This is the part of the world that is going to close in on itself and bring together the two halves of the world. Nevertheless, we know that Christopher Columbus was not interested in discovering a new world. Christopher Columbus was positing the notion that by sailing west, he would reach here. When Christopher Columbus suggested this, not first to the king and queen of neighboring Spain, but to the king of Portugal, because 15th century Portugal was the pioneer the leader in exploration, Christopher Columbus, as a Genoese, a member of the Genoese merchant colony in the Iberian Peninsula, rivals of the Venetians who had been pushed into the Western Mediterranean by Venetian mastery of the Eastern Mediterranean, the Genoese were heavily investing in banking, in money lending throughout North Africa and in the kingdoms of Aragon, Castile, and Portugal. So there's many, many Genoese present. The Genoese were pushing very hard at replacing the Jews, were being increasingly persecuted as the great bankers of the Iberian Christian monarchies. There was a Genoese interest in working very closely with these Iberian kingdoms. And Christopher Columbus's suggestion to the king of Portugal is based on the idea that certainly the world is round, and certainly the Portuguese cosmographers knew it very well. This is where we can dispel a first myth. We know that the circumference of the world was calculated in about 200 BC by a mathematical genius in Hellenistic Egypt. He was a Greek writing Egyptian, or he was an Egyptian Greek, whatever he was, Eratosthenes was one of the greatest geniuses of all time because in Alexandria, he found a dry well. He planted a stick at the bottom of this well and he observed the shadow cast by the stick at noon. Then he went further south, going up the Nile, and an Asyut in southern Egypt, found another well, dry well, planted a stick, and observed the shadow cast at noon. Simply by measuring the difference in the length of the shadows cast by these sticks at different latitudes, he was able to calculate the circumference of the planet within a hundred kilometers or so of accuracy an extraordinary feat, but which means that the scientific elite of humanity always knew not only that the world was round, but how round it was. <laughs> now, Christopher Columbus, in his bold suggestion to King John II of Portugal in the 1480s was, your Majesty, the ancient Greek calculations are wrong by one half. Christopher Columbus suggested to the Portuguese king the distance between here and here is half of what your cosmographers think. And the Portuguese cosmographers concluded from their calculations that Christopher Columbus was crazy. They essentially said, our dear sir, theoretically, you are right. Theoretically, we could sail from Lisbon and reach Japan 
as described by Marco Polo. However, no ships that we have could possibly carry enough provisions to get us across such a distance for so long. We simply cannot do it. Besides, the Portuguese were extremely busy trying to find their way around Africa to go where they really wanted to go, that is, India. So there's going to be a kind of a race between the Portuguese and the Castilians because Christopher Columbus will go to Castile and beg an audience with the king of Aragon and the queen of Castile, Ferdinand and Isabel, who will decide in 1492, because of particular political circumstances that we'll see, to give Christopher Columbus his chance. And of course, Christopher Columbus is going to make that bold move across the Atlantic and find something that he is convinced is somewhere on the eastern coast of Asia, provoking panic in Lisbon. And finally, a treaty arranged by Pope Alexander VI, separating all lands to be discovered down a line drawn by the Pope here at the Treaty of Tordesillas. Everything east of that line that wasn't already Christian would go to the Portuguese. Everything west of that line would go to the Castilians. And the Brazilian bulge, discovered in 1500, turned out to be east of that line, which is, of course, why Brazil is Portuguese and the rest of America became Castilian. Now, the problems of navigation in this world were compounded by the fact that here you have in the South Atlantic a major gyre. The currents are circular, which means that sailing with traditional craft along the African coast meant hugging against the wind, hugging against the currents, and being pushed back constantly. So we'll see that it's going to take the Portuguese something like 80 years to reach the tip of Africa. The currents, however, being circular, practically take you to Brazil. And then they take you back around the Cape, which is going to explain much of the Portuguese discoveries. Christopher Columbus is the one who allows himself to be carried by these east-west currents to the Caribbean. But the trade pattern of the world before Christopher Columbus is one which completely ignores, of course, this part of the world, which is essentially one that links Venice and the Spice Islands here along a sea route which takes you using the monsoon winds, which carry you in wintertime directly across what the Portuguese would one day know as the Great Gulf. And then in the summertime, they carry you in the other direction. These routes would take the spices, pepper, especially from the South Indian coast here, up two alternate sea routes. Either you go up the Red Sea or you go up the Persian Gulf. If you take the Persian Gulf route, you have to go through the bottleneck of Ormuz. You can reach the port of Basra. And here, either at Ormuz or at Basra, the caravans land come from the Chinese world and deliver their goods at the ports here. Then caravans, camel, take them again to the Mediterranean. The other possible route or route takes you up the Red Sea. The problem with the Red Sea is that with traditional sailing craft, it's almost impossible to navigate further north than a line here. Too many countercurrents until the age of steam meant that sailors from the Indian Ocean world would have to disembark their craft either on the Arabian side or on the African, that is the Egyptian side. And then caravans would go up either to Alexandria or to Beirut, taking these goods to the Mediterranean shore. Once you've reached Alexandria or Beirut, 
These were both under the domination of the Sultan of Egypt in the 15th century, and like all Egyptian powers that can project military might, the Egyptian Sultan controlled not only Egypt, but both shores of the Red Sea, Mecca and Medina, the holy places, but all the way down to the tip of Arabia, and he also controlled what are now Palestine, Israel, Lebanon, Jordan, and Syria, which meant that even caravans going up the Gulf eventually would have to deliver their, go their goods to his warehouses. Then here, among the Europeans, by the beginning of the 15th century, the Venetians had established a monopoly of trade. They controlled the Eastern Mediterranean. They traded with the Egyptian Sultan. Venice is a Venice because it is as far north as you can get in the Mediterranean world. Ships can go this far, and from Venice, they can offload their goods, and mule trains can take goods that actually came from India to the markets of Central Europe. The main good that Europeans craved was pepper. Pepper to preserve spoiling meat. Pepper believed to cure just about every disease. Pepper so precious that it was known as the spice, so that when you paid in species, or as the French say to this day, in espèce, what it meant was that you could buy a house by putting a bag of pepper on the table. This was wealth. Pepper is a wonderful product to transport because you can pick it green from its vine-like tree somewhere down on the Malabar coast of India or in Southeast Asia. It tastes like a grape, looks like a small grape, but a fiery one, just as juicy. It doesn't keep that way. You pick a grape, you can hold it in your palm, and within an hour, it has shriveled and dried into the little black ball that we know. But this little black ball, so light, so easy to carry, can be preserved for years without any refrigeration of any kind. So it was one of the easiest products to store. You can fill sacks with pepper, load them in India, take them up the Red Sea. Here, say, you disembark on the Egyptian side. You have the camel caravans taking them to the Nile. The camel caravans discharge these pepper bags that are sailed along the Nile, just carrying down the current until they reach Alexandria. And two Venetian fleets a year could come. They paid for the monopoly with the Sultan. They pay the Sultan of Egypt a fortune in taxes. They collect the pepper. They take it up to Venice. And from Venice, merchants come from all over Europe to buy pepper. As the Venetians say, L'arzento va dove il pepper. Money goes where the pepper is. <laughs> and among other people who were furious at the Venetians, everybody hated the Venetians. All Europe was jealous of the Venetians. They were the wealthiest. They were the most advanced. They had the most flourishing printing presses by the end of the 15th century. They were richer than anybody else. They had this monopoly on this wonderful trade. And as one of the Portuguese chroniclers would say, until our fortunate king discovered another route to India, all the pepper of the world came from India to the Red Sea to Alexandria. And there, the Venetians would pick up the pepper and sell it to all of Christendom. The Portuguese are going to try to find a way around. But Marco Polo is one of many Venetians who actually reconnoitered the entire route, the entire pepper trade on which we'll be concentrating here. Now, we'll, we're going to look at all these traditional methods of navigation, but we have to remember something which is difficult to show, that I, though I will try, which is the Venetians are buying pepper. How do they pay for it? They have to pay for it in gold. And the problem is, 15th century Europeans have very little gold. 
the main sources of gold, the mainstay of currency, of trade in the 15th century is held by the Muslims. The Muslims have one source of gold here in West Africa, along the bend of the river Niger, lots of gold dust, and the kings of Mali have converted to Islam, are among the richest kings of Islam, and they're trading in gold dust. The other source of gold dust is from Zimbabwe. And Islam extends about this far down the East African coast. So the gold dust feeds the trade. It goes to Cairo. It goes to Alexandria. If the Venetians want gold, they have to sell manufactured products to the Muslims for gold. But they recycle the gold right back into the Egyptian economy. The gold, however, leaves Egypt and accumulates in India, which has the characteristic, pretty much until the British totally controlled the country at the end of the 18th century. India is where the gold and the silver of the world accumulated over thousands of years. Not that India has so much gold or silver, but because India, since pretty much 2700 BC, has been selling to the world products that the rest of the world wanted, whereas India itself wanted nothing from the outside world except war horses from Persia and Arabia. Otherwise, India had nothing to buy and everything to sell. The most wondrous cloths and wonderful woods, wonderful spices. Gold and silver accumulated in India in the temple treasuries when the Muslims came charging down from Central Asia and conquered northern India. They certainly looted Indian temples, but they stayed in India, founded empires, and essentially recycled the gold and silver. Ever since the days of the Roman Empire, we have Roman historians complaining about an imbalance in trade. The Romans, through Egypt, are already well aware of this trade route, and they're importing wonderful goods from India into Roman Egypt, and gold is leaving the Roman Empire and accumulating in India. So it is well perceived by Europeans that the greatest source of gold in the world is ultimately to be tapped in India. However, the Europeans do know that there is gold dust being produced here and here. Between the Europeans and the gold here, here, and the accumulation of gold here lies the Muslim world. How do we get around it? That's another major problem. The Muslims are extremely wealthy because they're right between India and the Europeans. The Spanish and the Portuguese are doing their very best by pillaging the Spanish Muslim towns of the south of the peninsula and recovering gold bullion, but there is a thirst for gold, a desire to find gold. Ultimately, we know that it will be America that will slake Europe's thirst for gold and silver, that will finally break Islam's monopoly of gold. Europeans will get gold from Mexico, from Peru, and the paradox of the 16th century is that when the Portuguese capture the India trade, they will be taking American gold and pouring it into India to buy Indian products. And so that means that into the 17th, 18th century, American gold is also feeding into India. So you get this extraordinary accumulation of wealth, meaning India is the place to go. How do you get there when the traditional European ship looks like can I have the next slide? Well, the traditional European ship looks like this. The, it was a, the Viking ship was a wonderful ship, here represented in the 11th century. But you can see the, um, you have a square sail, which is good if the wind is aft, but you can't tack against the wind because of that square sail. So you have to row if you don't have a good wind. And the steerage is with a long paddle, hence starboard. You have the, the steering. But you, you have a steersman who 
paddles your boat. It's the Chinese who are going to invent the stern rudder. But until pretty much the beginning of the 15th century, European boats have hardly progressed beyond this. Next. Now, uh, OK, I'll, I'll see if you can make out what's happening here. This is one of the very earliest serious European maps done in the late 14th century by a uh, Catalan Jew, Abraham Kreshkesh. You can see a very accurate Iberian Peninsula, France, England, Africa. Here you have the King of Mali holding up a gold nugget. Here you have a Tuareg Muslim caravaneer. And here you have a little boat, the Genoese Vivaldi brothers, who are trying to sail out into the Atlantic. It's going to become an obsession of the Portuguese. If we can get beyond the Muslim barrier, somehow we can get to the source of gold here. Uh, maybe I can ask you to, to dim the lights so the pictures are sharper, please. You think you can dim the lights? I can, sir. It's on the desk. I, I don't dare <laughs> touch it. Well, I'm not sure I should either. Is that in lighting? Okay, that's much better, isn't it? Okay, so you see the, yeah. Understood, okay. So you, you can see the little boat here, it has its square sail, and you're not going to get very far with a boat like that. So this is an insuperable barrier to the Europeans. They have a hatred of the Muslim world, of course, as the great ideological enemy, but it's also the world which has a monopoly of gold and is the great middleman for trade with India. Next, a very fond European hope, which is going to last into the 16th century, is if only we could find some king somewhere beyond the Islamic world who would be a Christian or who could be made to convert to Christianity. He could become our ally against the Muslims. And the myth surfaced that way beyond the Muslim world, there is a priest king who is the ruler of a Christian kingdom converted by the disciple of Christ, Saint Thomas, after the death of the savior who went as far as India and converted a local king. This is the kingdom of Prester John, John the priest, who the Portuguese will eventually identify as in this 16th century painting with the king of Ethiopia. And in the 16th century, the Portuguese indeed will strike an alliance with Ethiopia and probably contributed, indeed did contribute to preserving Ethiopian Christianity with military help, muskets, military advisors, against Muslim conquest. So this is the myth of Prester John, but Prester John earlier was associated with probably some Christian who would be way out in Mongolia, somewhere there. Next picture. Now this is the theological view of the world accepted in the 14th and 15th century Christian world. Now, what you see here is a stylized representation of three continents, Europe, Africa, Asia. Asia is on top, and at the very top you have this tabernacle, which represents the Garden of Eden. Asia is on top because our souls have fallen from the Garden of Eden. So the West is on the bottom in this particular orientation. The Christians are very keen to represent this wonderful stylization of three continents, making us bear in mind that it is the Europeans who really invented this concept of continents. The Greeks 
came up with the idea that the world must be divided between a Europe, an Asia, and what they called Libya, that is Africa, but as Herodotus says very well in the fifth century BC, to the north of the Black Sea, Europe and Asia meet and nothing any longer divides them. Under the Roman Empire, the idea of Europe, Africa, and Asia ceased to have any kind of cultural or political significance whatsoever. Yes, there was a province of Africa, Tunisia, essentially. But that was just an administrative division. What was important was whether you were a subject of the Roman emperor. If you were a German outside the empire, you might be European, but that made absolutely no difference to the way you were regarded politically. If you were a Persian, you were an Asian, but so were the Palestinians and Syrians or Anatolians who were under Roman rule, and they were OK. So Asia, Africa, Europe did not have profound cultural meaning any longer under the Roman Empire whatsoever. Where we get the first idea that Europe, Africa, and Asia can possibly mean anything is in the very, very end of the 11th century. When Pope Urban II, in the year 1095, in the French town of Clermont, Clermont, preaches to the knights and to the people, we must deliver Jerusalem from the hands of the Saracens. The Muslims themselves recognized no Europe, no Asia, no Africa. They just had climatic bands, no continents. But Pope Urban II says, of the three parts of the world that are mentioned by the ancients, Asia and Africa now obey the law of Muhammad, and only Europe partly obeys the law of Christ. This becomes the European projection. In the 15th century or in the 13th, no Asian, no African, certainly no Native American, regarded himself or herself as Asian, African, or certainly American. These are entirely European cartographical projections, which the world has come to accept. Next. Another stylization of the 15th century. Asia, the largest, with Noah's Ark here. Africa, Europe. Next. You can see what a theological idea this is. Even as late as the early 16th century, the German engraver shows the three leaves, the three continents, as if they were a three-leaf clover, the Red Sea here between Asia and Africa, it also is supposed to signify the Trinity. And Jerusalem is in the very center. The problem is Scandinavia is hard to fit. <laughs> and America Terra Nova is even harder to fit. So the whole scheme begins to explode, even as a concept, by the 16th century. Next. Actually, 15th century Europeans, when they were serious, were using this map. And this is certainly the map that someone like Marco Polo would have had in mind. It was rediscovered in 1402, brought from Constantinople to Venice. It is the map of the world that the Venetians want the world to accept. It's the map of Ptolemy, the Alexandrian Greek of the second century AD, and what it shows is an Indian Ocean that is completely closed, like a lake. India is not properly perceived as a, as a, as a triangle. Uh, Sri Lanka, Ceylon, looms enormously because that was such an important trading place for spices. You can see that the only way to get from the Mediterranean to the Indian Ocean is through the narrow isthmus of Suez. And since the Venetians have a monopoly for all Christian Europe of trade with Egypt, it means that for the Venetians and the Egyptians, indeed, this is the only route that will ever be possible. If the Portuguese, for example, want to get around, they're facing an Africa that ends with the very end of the world. So this is the conception that Marco Polo has in mind of a closed 
Indian Ocean. Theoretically, you could sail from here to there, but how far is it really? This is the map that Christopher Columbus argues is accurate. Basically, he tells the king of Portugal, no matter how much you try to sail around Africa, you will never get around it. You are wasting your time. If you want to double-cross the Venetians, take away their monopoly, you have to sail that way to get there. But you can't break in this way. Next. <clears throat> the Muslims, however, suggest another map. This, this is a copy, an early 15th century copy of a map that became very famous in the Muslim world, though it was designed by El Idrisi in Sicily. He was a Moroccan geographer, a guest, resident scholar at the court of the Christian king of Sicily, the Norman Roger II. The book became so famous as a compendium of geography that even in the Arab world and the Muslim world, it was called the Book of Roger, Kitab Rujar. El Idrisi is suggesting another vision of the world, which is that an ocean surrounds the entire inhabited world. Theoretically, you could sail around Africa and come into the Indian Ocean. No Muslim has ever gone further south than here or than here. Why should he? He has everything he already needs. But to the Portuguese who are going to launch into the Atlantic, this map is the possibility. However, there are dangers on this map too. All around the outer perimeter of the world, you can see a chain of magnetic mountains. Magnetism terrified the ancients and the medievals. What was this force that caused a, a needle piercing through a straw and left to float in a little box of water? An invention of the Chinese, which reached the Muslim world by at latest the 12th century and was known to Europeans by the 13th. What made this needle turn? There is some magnetic force in the world and it was believed in medieval times, certainly in the Indian Ocean world, that on the perimeter of the world exist these magnetic mountains. If you sail too far into the outer ocean, your boat, if it is nailed together with iron nails, will be pulled by these mountains. The nails will ultimately be yanked out. Your boat will fall apart, and you will sink. Those mountains are magic mountains. If you reach them, you can climb them, and at the summit of the mountain, you can go to the heavens. Dante eventually will identify one of those mountains with purgatory itself. It's the reason given by sailors in the Indian Ocean until the 16th century, and in fact, in traditional craft, until the early 20th. Never nail your boats. Sew them, as you're going to discover. Next. So the trade of the Muslim world in the age of Marco Polo in the 13th century is borne by camels. People who want to move fast ride horses. To carry goods, you use camels. There are no longer any wheels. Wheels have been discarded because once you have mastered the camel, you don't have to maintain good roads. The camel will take your goods anywhere. The Muslim world essentially renounces the use of wheels. They're only reintroduced with European colonization in the 19th century. But we're going to be looking more at shipping. Take the next one, please. This is a good picture painted in 13th century Iraq of the kind of vessel that was used in the Indian Ocean when Muslims had pretty much a monopoly of all sailing in the Indian Ocean world. You can see that the crew are Gujarati, who are becoming Muslim by the 13th century, with Ethiopians also as members of the crew. The Iraqi Arabs here are the passengers. You can see that it's a sewn boat. You see these crisscrosses here? No nails. No nails. Instead, what you used was the fiber of a coconut. 
the favorite coconut grows in the Maldive Islands and in the Lakadive Islands of the Indian Ocean. You weave these coconut strands into twine. They make wonderful thread through the holes in the planks of your boat. You pass these threads, you bind them tight, you put it in water, and the threads swell until they make the holes absolutely watertight. And they do not rust, which means that these ships are sewn boats, not nailed, which is fine for the kind of navigation you had in the Indian Ocean world until the turn of the 15th century. The problem is when the Portuguese come in with nailed ships, they have guns on their boats. And you can't put a gun on this. The recoil of a heavy gun would cause the boat to tear apart. But you have another innovation of tremendous significance. The earliest documentation we have visually shows us the stern rudder in Chinese painting of the late 12th century. By the early 13th century, as here, 1220s, we see the stern rudder already being used on a Muslim ship in the Indian Ocean. We take the stern rudder for granted, but it is far more efficient than the paddle. It hinges on the ship, to the back of the ship, and the steersman can just rotate and ultimately use a wheel, but steering his boat that way. What you can't see on this picture is that the Indian Ocean boatmen have also invented a sail that is far more efficient than the European sail, the Latin sail, or triangular sail, which allows you to tack against the wind. So that even if you have a contrary wind, you can maneuver your way and tack. Whereas the square sail forces you, if you don't have an aft wind, to row. Next. Now, we'll go through the, the wonders of the Indian Ocean. The Arabian Nights stories are typical. This is another group of stories, 13th century paintings. You go too far, like this Ethiopian ship's scout with the anchor, the sewn ship, and he comes to one of the magic islands at the end of the Indian Ocean where you have sphinxes and harpies. Next. Or you can have the discovery of the demons who were imprisoned in stone by Solomon as punishment for their rebellion against God, this 14th century Persian Iraqi painting. Next. The um, traditional Midi Indian Ocean, and Marco Polo mentions it himself, believed that a great bird hovered just over the Strait of Madagascar, between Madagascar and East Africa. Anybody who would dare sail into that strait had reached the limits of permissible navigation, and the great bird could swoop down and devour you. We know the famous story in the Arabian Nights, but it's repeated many other works of Islamic literature, of the shipwrecked sailor who attaches himself to the claws, the talons of the great bird, and is able to be flown back to civilization and safety. This bird is probably an Islamization of Garuda, the Indian bird that is the mount of the god, Vishnu. Next, it's a symbol of the sun. There's another vision of the great bird uh, painted in late 16th century India. This traveler is lucky. These travelers are not. <laughs> Marco Polo himself says, as he is sailing back from China to the Persian Gulf, we dare not go for too far south. The great bird may be there. The great bird, Rok. Rok. Next. Here's another late 16th century Indian painting from a 12th century, late 12th century Persian story of a traveler who is carried by the great bird to the realm of the sky, to the realm of God, because the, the bird is a guardian of the divine secrets. Next. Or here, in this early 14th century Persian painting, the bird is carrying a symbol of the soul to the mountain, one of the magic mountains 
that connects this lower world with the beginning of the sky itself. Next. This is one of the rarest 13th century Turkish paintings I've been able to find, which actually shows that the mountain with the nest of the great bird here reaches the gateway of heaven. And it's supposed to rise from the Indian Ocean. This is the great mountain that is Purgatory and Dante's system, against which Ulysses is wrecked in Dante's Inferno. Next. As you can see, in Dante's system, Dante and Marco Polo are exact contemporaries. They died within four years of each other. Dante addresses the city of Florence in this early 15th century painting. If you don't behave yourself, here's your counterpart, the city of hell. But on the opposite hemisphere, the world is around, but in the Atlantic, all you get is a great mountain rising, which corresponds to purgatory. At the top is the Garden of Eden, and then you are taken into the heavenly spheres. That's the system of the world. And nobody is supposed to reach that mountain if he has not been blessed or she has not been blessed by God. That's the purgatory mountain. Next. So Dante can leap from the top of the mountain because he is a blessed soul, and he will be led by his spiritual guide, Beatrice, through the seven spheres, which are exactly the same. Next. In the Muslim system, this is by the, somebody who is reputed to have been the Arab pilot of Vasco da Gama himself. It's not really true, it's a legend. Nevertheless, you get the system with the earth in the middle and the spheres surrounding it until you reach Saturn and ultimately the throne of God. Next. The Muslims, like the Christians, believe that the soul can rise, in this case, guided by Gabriel in the example of the prophet, through the spheres, over the earth. Here the prophet rises from Mecca in this painting of the 15th century. Next. And this wonderful 16th century Persian painting shows the prophet rising through his spheres and leaving the earth behind. And you can see the accuracy of the atmosphere surrounding the world. Why Chinese clouds? Because, next. The Mongol invasions. Between 1220 and 1258, the Mongols conquered virtually the entire Islamic world of Asia. And though they became Muslims themselves, their impact brought a wave of Chinese influences in Islamic art. And this painting of the early 14th century suggests something of the violence of this invasion. An invasion which, however, when the Mongols destroyed Baghdad itself in 1258, to the last crusaders hugging the Palestinian coast, the Mongols seemed to offer salvation. And since the great Mongol ruler in distant Beijing was not a Muslim, nor the sublords of the Near East, the Mongols, were not Muslims, it followed that the crusaders might be finding in the great Mongol emperor in Beijing the ally. So for just 50 years, the Mongols are going to allow the Europeans, especially the Venetians, who are the forerunners, into a world that had been closed to them. Next. Even though they're going to convert to Islam in the western part of their empire, like this Mongol lord of 1295, who is represented as if he were Solomon, with the seal of Solomon. Next. Or this Mongol lord of the early 14th century in Tabriz in Iran with the Chinese influences that you can see in the art. Marco Polo is moving through this world, but he's moving before 1295, before these Mongol rulers of the western part of the empire, in the Islamic part, have converted to Islam. So they're still holding out the hope that they may become allies to the Christians. Next. The last hope that the Crusaders and the Western Europeans will have will be in the half-Mongol, half-Turkic warlord of Samarkand, Timurlang, Timur the Lame, Timurlang, or Tamerlane as they call him, who in 1402, despite being a Muslim himself, crushed 
the Turkish Sultanate in a terrible battle of Ankara, which caused the Turks to stop, held them from Constantinople for another half century, and encouraged Western Europeans to think that maybe Tamerlane could be the new great king that the Western Europeans could reach out to, and the kings of France and Castile will actually send embassies to him, which will reach him just before he dies in 1405. Here he is depicted as enthroned in near Samarkand by the great painter Bezad in the 15th century under his very Mongolian style yurt. Next. So one of our earliest copies of the book of Marco Polo, which was dictated in French by Marco Polo to a, f a fellow inmate in prison in Genoa after his return, wars between Venice and Genoa all the time, rivalry. And Marco Polo in his cell after, 19, after 1297, 1298 dictates his cellmate is a professional romancer, a romancer of Arthurian chivalry, knighthood. And this version of the book was done in 1410 for the Duke of Burgundy, showing the brothers about to depart. Next. The brothers Matteo Nicolò Polo are taking letters from the Pope as messages to the Mongol emperor in Beijing. That is the purpose of their mission. Next. They're taking leave of the Western kingdoms, the uncle and father and young Marco here. Next. Here is the story they tell of the assassins. Do you know the story of the assassins? According to one of the Muslim stories that Marco Polo will repeat, there was a terrible sect of Muslims called the Ismailis who had a mountain fortress in northern Persia and other fortresses in what is now Lebanon. They were ruled by the old man of the mountain, as Marco Polo describes it. The old man of the mountain would select certain political figures for targeted murder. To be able to murder these people, he would bring into his castle foolish young men, ply them with wine laced with hashish. When they passed out, he would take them into a wonderful garden where they would wake up and found themselves surrounded with all the delights of paradise, wine, women, and song. Then he would drug them again, and when they woke up and found themselves in the castle hall, he would say, did you see what paradise was like? Yes. Do you believe in it now? Yes. Well, then just go murder Sultan so-and-so, Grand Prime Minister so-and-so. They'll probably get killed, but that's OK. You're going right back there. You want to go back, don't you? Yes. And so these people were very feared. And according to their enemies, including all the Orthodox Muslims, Christian Crusaders too, these people were under the influence of hashish, hence they were known in Arabic as the hashashin, which was pronounced by the French Crusaders as assassin, hence the word assassin. That's the origin of it. So this is the representation here. Next. Now the, the brothers are traveling into the Himalayan world. There's the abominable snowman, the wild man here. Next. And they are presented by a minister with the Pope's letters to Kublai Khan, Kublai Khan in Beijing, represented as the French early 15th century artist can best imagine. Next. And they take their Christianity very seriously, and they preach the gospel to the great Khan, who is interested. But in fact, we know that Kublai Khan was interested in every religion, as long as it kept all his subjects quiet and happy. Next. And the brothers are going to go back to the West with a message for the Pope. Next, since we don't have a good resolution here. Now, the Venetians, the Polo brothers and, and nephew, are very interested in the great Khan's wealth. But the great Khan of China himself, if he is interested in getting 
pepper has to buy it from India, from Ceylon, Sri Lanka, or the South Indian coast. And he has to pay for it in gold. Here is the pepper, and here is actually the kind of ship that had come into use among Europeans by the early 15th century, still has the square sail, but now has the stern rudder, adopted by the Europeans from the Muslims of the Mediterraneans, of the Mediterranean, themselves had got it from the Indian Ocean, who themselves got it from the Chinese. Next. Here is the, the book of Marco Polo's imagining of the great Hindu king of Calicut, who controls so much of the pepper trade. And since the descriptions of the Polo brothers included the idea that the people of very far south India and Sri Lanka are naked and black, this is the way they're represented. They're in, this is the pepper crop, and here the pepper is presented to the king of Calicut for his inspection. Next. And here is Marco Polo himself sampling the pepper on the Malabar coast. This was when he accompanied a Mongol fleet around China, around India, up, the Pers up to the Persian Gulf, a Mongol bride for a Mongol ruler in Persia. And from Persia, then the Polo brothers and nephew made their way back to Venice. Next. The Polo descriptions of the worship of Kali in India, the black goddess, which the French illustrator has imagined as nuns of a kind worshiping this sculpture. Next. Naked Indians, imagined by early 15th century French. Next. The Andaman Islanders. The Andaman Islands in the Indian Ocean are supposed to have a wonderful pepper crop, but they were described as being a very ugly looking people. And Marco Polo understood it to mean that they had dogs' heads. <laughs> Nobody had been there. That, and he, that he knew. Next. Even stranger creatures. Do you think you can get the, uh, the focus on that, please? Even stranger creatures are supposed to live on the edges of the Indian Ocean. If you know Shakespeare's Othello, you know that Othello impresses Desdemona by talking about the anthropophagi and those whose heads do grow beneath their shoulders. Othello himself, good Venetian general that he is, is describing what is supposed to lie at the end of the world. This type of character hops around on one foot, and when he's tired, he uses his foot as a parasol. <laughs> this is the Cyclops, and this character has his head coming out from the middle of his chest. Next. This is the most wonderful creature that Europeans imagine is in India. It is the beautiful unicorn the magic animal whose horn, if dipped into turbid, troubled water, purifies water, takes away all poison from water. It is the horn that can cure all things. Europeans get the description and imagine it as this milk-white creature that will ultimately, by the 15th century, be assimilated to one of the symbols of Christ, the unicorn is sacred. It is an Indian animal. If we can only reach India and recover the unicorn, the salvation of the world is at hand. However, the real animal behind this is the Indian rhinoceros, imagined this way. Next. So we come to some realism here in the book of Marco Polo. He is very aware when he disembarks at Hormuz at the very entrance to the Gulf, that this is, where, this is one of the greatest trading markets in the world. The goods of Persia, Central Asia come down to the Gulf, and the goods of India, like this elephant, go up the Gulf, and all is traded in this island. Who holds Hormuz at the entrance to the Gulf can control the trade of one third of Asia. This is something the Portuguese already know before 1498. Next. So we move out of Marco Polo's world into the Portuguese, 
and we look at the ship that made it all possible in 1492. This engraving from very early in the age of print dates from 1492. It is Portuguese, and you can see that the Portuguese have invented the ship that will dominate world affairs for the following 400 years. They have the square sail, but also triangular sails. So they can tack against the wind or use the full force of the wind. That means multiple sails, several masts, multiple rigging. They have the stern rudder here, nailed boats, and this terrible invention, gunwales, gun ports. These ships become floating forts. Nothing like it will be able to resist the onslaught of this particular boat, which the Portuguese call by a word that they have adopted from Arabic, qariba, a boat, and they call their boat, the product of the Lisbon shipyards of the 15th century, caravela, the little qariba, our little qariba. But it is bigger than any qariba. This is the caravel. Next. By 1520, a boat like that in the Indian Ocean blows away any opposition, terrorizes the coasts, dominates the shipping. It is the great Portuguese man of war. The Castilians adopt it. The Dutch adopt it. The English will adopt it. This is the queen of the seas with its mouths of fire. Galleys in the Mediterranean world in the late 15th century could mount a few guns in front, at the prow, aft, at the poop, but not along the gunwales. It would interfere with the rowers. This boat is the floating gun platform on all sides. Next. The surrender of Granada to King Ferdinand of Aragon and Queen Isabel of Castile with Cardinal Mendoza here. Take the next picture. The Moorish king of Granada surrenders in early 1492. His men constitute themselves prisoners of the Castilian king. Christopher Columbus actually watched this ceremony. And he says it. I myself beheld the Moorish king kiss the hands of your majesties and the banners of Castile and the Holy Cross raised upon the towers of the Alhambra. Because only then did Christopher Columbus receive permission to embark. But by then, the Portuguese had an 80 years head start. Next. The Portuguese are just as much crusaders as the Castilians or as the French. The Portuguese, in fact, are a crusader kingdom. Lisbon was captured by a force of English and French crusaders in 1147 on their way to the Holy Land to have a good stopping place on the Atlantic before entering the Mediterranean. It grew up as a crusader kingdom and will place itself among various saints under the invocation of St. James the Moor Slayer, the brother of Christ, the twin brother of Christ, but who wields a sword and rides a horse and is called St. James the Moor Slayer, Santiago Matamoros in the Castilian language. Next. The founder of the Portuguese kingdom, Don Alfonso Henriques, Don Alfonso, son of Henry, here represented in early 16th century style. The banner of Portugal, the coat of arms of Portugal, are the five wounds of Christ. And here is the port of Lisbon in the early 16th century, where you see that the Portuguese use both kinds of warships, the caravel and also the galley, because the galley can serve you to take you along narrow coastlines into inlets, up rivers. The Portuguese use every kind of navigation that is known. They are pushed out to sea by the, Portuguese, by the Castilians. Next. The Portuguese court until the end of the 15th century still hopes to capture Granada. And the Moorish king is shown here as a vassal of the Portuguese court. And you also have the chief rabbi. Jews will very much serve the Portuguese as explorers, too, 
until 1496 when they're expelled under Castilian pressure, just as they had been expelled from Castile in 1492. Next. King Alfonso V, kneeling before the patron of the dynasty, St. Vincent, hopes to conquer many citadels on the Moroccan coast, and he's pushing the Portuguese line of forts ever further down the West African coast, but his uncle, Prince Henry the Navigator, is the main sponsor of these expeditions. Here's the future King John II, who will say no to Christopher Columbus. Next. Prince Henry the Navigator, who never navigated anywhere except to the Moroccan coast once, but who sponsored all these expeditions until his death in 1460. Next. Prince Henry the Navigator. Next. Now, we remember this map. With the age of print, it is multiplied on German and Venetian presses. The Indian Ocean is closed. This the Portuguese refused to accept. They will find a way around Africa, but can they? Next. Now, this is going to be the great expedition. The Portuguese are pushing down here, and they're in pretty much despair by the 1460s when they realize they've come to a dead end. They were hoping they were rounding Africa here, but they have to go further and further down the coast. John II is going to order Bartolomeu de Vias to go down and reach the tip of Africa at whatever cost and find if indeed there is a passage between the Atlantic and the Indian Oceans. But nobody in the 1480s knows this for sure. It's a theory, but nobody has verified it. Next. Oh, here is a wonderful series of African drawings by the great Portuguese cartographer Pedro Reynel between 1484 and 1492, you can see he drew the map of Africa here. By 1484, the Portuguese are actually on the verge of reaching the Congo. They will even convert the, a Congolese king to Christianity. They're also setting up a great slave fort. And they're beginning the, the terrible trade in human beings to work on sugar plantations in the African, in, I'm sorry, in the Portuguese Açores. Here you can see that the map maker has added further African coastline. They're going very, very far south by the 1480s. Next. This is the great castle built in 1484, Castelo de Mina, now in, um, in Ghana, El Mina. This, was, this is the great port hole or the great doorway through which so many slaves would be embarked ultimately to the New World. It's one of the most famous, horrendous tourist sites in Africa. But it was from here also that the Portuguese began trading with West African peoples here from which they obtained gold dust and beginning to reduce European dependency on Muslim intermediaries. Next. This is a wonderful vision by a Nigerian artist of Portuguese warriors disembarking from their ship on their coast. The cross, the steel lance, the chain mail, the terrible beards. Next. <clears throat> Another Nigerian vision of a late 15th, early 16th century Portuguese soldier. Next. And a Portuguese crossbowman. This is as close as you'll get to the vision that American Indians had in the Caribbean when they first saw Columbus's men. This is exactly this period. Next. This is one of the most important maps in the entire history of the world. King John II ordered his pilot, Bartholomew, Bartholomew Dias, don't come back until you reach, reach the tip. Bartholomew Dias finally saw the coast inclined northeast was convinced that he had entered the Indian Ocean, but his men refused to go any farther. They were terrified. They were exhausted. By 1489, the Portuguese started in 1415, they had finally reached the tip of Africa. They go back to Lisbon. Bartolomeu Dias tells the king, John, 
terrible place. He called it O Cabo de Tormentish, the Cape of Torments, the Cape of Storms. King John said, no, Cabo de Boa Esperança. This is the Cape of Good Hope. Christopher Columbus is downcast. This is when the Portuguese tell him we're not interested in your project. We have found the way around. This is the first map by a German cartographer in 1490 actually to show this piercing, like a piercing in the mind, the Indian Ocean may be open. Christopher Columbus ejected from Lisbon, goes to Spain, and in 1492, he does find something. And he returns, and as it happens, his first landfall was Lisbon. And King John II of Portugal was horrified to see Christopher Columbus come down from the boat with prisoners who didn't look like Africans. They had long, sleek, black hair. Indians. Did Christopher Columbus, after all, get to India before us? The Portuguese are so upset. They're about to go to war with the Castilians. The Pope intervenes, and the Treaty of 1494, Treaty of Tordesillas, says everything east of a line that the Pope draws, an imaginary line right down the Atlantic, everything east of that line goes to the Portuguese. As long as it's not Christian, you can conquer it. Everything west of that line will go to the crown of Castile. Famous division, which has led to a Brazilian legend, which is absolutely fake. The Portuguese must have known of the existence of Brazil at the time of the treaty. <laughs> it's not true, but and there's no evidence of that. But nevertheless, that was very convenient. Next, an Italian painting from 1490. These two cosmographers really show Africa as the Portuguese cartographers, who were geniuses at cartography, are beginning to see it much longer than anybody had believed. Nevertheless, they're not yet sure did Bartolomeo Dias really round a cape into the Indian Ocean itself? Nobody knows for sure. Next. So in 1496, the new king, Emmanuel of Portugal, Emmanuel the Fortunate, is going to, this is his coat of arms with the armillary spheres. He is going to order, next, one of his favorite knights, Don Vasco da Gama. Almirante de India, his coat of arms. Don Vasco da Gama, Admiral of India. You go where Bartolomeo Dias had stopped. You're even going to take Bartolomeo Dias's brother with you, who had been on the expedition. Several of the people who had gone to the Cape, and you are going to find out once and for all. This, we're going to end with this great journey. Next. So here's Vasco da Gama somewhat later in life, when he was made viceroy of the Portuguese possessions in India. Next. His three ships, just like Christopher Columbus, leaving in 1497. Next. Down the African coast they go. They know this coast. They're hugging it in this map of 1519, of the 1497 expedition. Next. This is the great adventure. Christopher Columbus had broken a taboo. He had gone across. He had allowed himself to be carried by the trade winds here. Vasco da Gama, instead of hugging the coast all the way down against the contrary currents, is going to dare to let his ships carry him in the gyre. Here he leaves the West African coast and lets his boats just sail. He nearly hit Brazil, very nearly. Came within a few miles of Brazil, and the gyre took him around until he reached here. Next. Here, the Portuguese come up through the Straits of Madagascar. Are they in the Indian Ocean or not? They're not sure. But on that day of April, of 1498, you get one of these miracles in human history. The Portuguese, one Portuguese ship founders on a sandbar off the coast of Mozambique. Up to now, the Portuguese have only seen African peoples who look just like the people on the other side of Africa. Where are they? Is this the Indian Ocean or not? Suddenly, the stranded boat is surrounded 
by dugout canoes in which are men, African in features, but wearing long white robes and turbans. And these men call out to the Portuguese on the boat in Arabic and say, are you Ottoman Turks? <laughs> Many Portuguese know Arabic. After all, they're right next to Morocco. And they have colonies by then on the Moroccan coast. And the Portuguese ship log writer, Alvaro Dengu, writes, when we heard that these were Moors who were calling out to us in Arabic, asking if we were Turks, we dropped to our knees on deck, tears pouring from our eyes, and we raised up thanks to the Virgin Mary. Because now we knew we were in the Indian Ocean. Next. <clears throat> this is the discovery of the Indian Ocean. One of the earliest maps we have. The genius of Portuguese port cartography the Portuguese ships are going to terrorize the little Muslim kingdoms all along the East African coast under the shadow of their guns until one Muslim king in Kenya, Milindi, gives them a pilot, I think a Gujarati actually, who takes them across what the Portuguese call the Great Gulf, and they reach Calicut in India. And if you can believe, among the many miracles of this journey, the first Portuguese sailor on a longboat sent off to the beach at Calicut. He's a digridadi, one of the jailbirds who were told back in Lisbon, you hang or you sail. What do you choose? <laughs> I, I, I sail. I sail. So these poor people were used to go on long boats and just check out the shore if the natives are hostile or not. If he gets killed, that's all right. You know, if he doesn't get killed, then good. You know, we, we have a scout. So this Portuguese sailor rolls up to the beach the two Muslim customs inspectors of the Hindu Maharaja of Calicut look at this man, look at the sails, and one of the customs inspectors says, if you can understand this language, El diablo que te doy, quien te trajo acá. I give you to the devil who brought you here. He said it in Castilian. <laughs> The Portuguese was amazed. <laughs> the customs inspectors boarded the admiral ship of Vasco da Gama. Everybody spoke in Spanish. Why? Because India was full of Spanish Muslims who had found jobs after the fall of Granada, gone through Egypt. India is the place to go. They recruit people like you. They need Arabic speakers. And the Portuguese were able to find Spanish Moors in every Indian port. <laughs> One of the miracles of world history. And here you certainly see, within a couple of years of the discovery of the sea route to India, secret of the monsoon, how the Portuguese so accurately mapped the Indian Ocean world. And they show the Muslim ships that they're going to be blowing out of the water with their caravels. Next. This, the map of 1502, if you realize what this represents as a triumph of the mind. In, in my humble opinion, this is the greatest map in world history in terms of what it really shows. This, 1499, Vasco da Gama was back. Immediately, King Emmanuel sent another expedition under Cabral, which, like Vasco da Gama, sails far out but hits Brazil. Now, on New Year's Day of 1500, Cabral detaches a boat back to Lisbon saying, this must be a new land. This is a terra nova. The, the, I'll call it the land of the Holy Cross, Santa Cruz. This is not India. India is here. This is where we're going. This is something else. And Cabral then sails on, follows the gyre, rounds the cape, makes his way to Calicut, which he bombards with his cannon and sets up bases further south with allies among other Hindu kings. This is the journey of the four continents. In 1500, Cabral links Europe, Africa, South America, and Asia, India. Up here, here's the, here's the, here's the line 
of the Treaty of Tordesillas. The Castilians, with Christopher Columbus, have discovered this. The Portuguese have even reached Labrador already. They dare move across the Atlantic. But Christopher Columbus here in Cuba and Haiti is insisting that he is somewhere here. <laughs> he is still in Asia in 1502. In fact, he even says, anybody in my crew who says differently will have his tongue cut out. <laughs> One member of the crew, Amerigo Vespucci, a Florentine navigator and cosmographer, decides that Christopher Columbus is impossible. Christopher Columbus has even reached the mainland here, but is determined to prove that this is Asia. Amerigo Vespucci, as soon as he can, when he gets back to Europe, joins Portuguese service, and King Emmanuel asks them to reconnoiter this coast while other Portuguese ships move increasingly into the Indian Ocean. Amerigo Vespucci, between 1503 and 1505, will go up and down this coastline, already so beautifully represented in this map of 1502, and will report, indeed, this is a new land, your majesty. Which is why the German cartographer Martin Waldseemüller, in 1507, will conclude Indeed, it is a new land. And since all the other continents have names, Asia, Europe, Africa, I will call this America. It is the reason. This map is so important because however many spaces and gaps you may still have, it is the first map in the history of the world to show the relation of the continents amongst each other. Basically, from then on, it's fill the gaps. Correct uh, Malaysia's position as compared to India's, but you're almost there already. Next. From 1519, this wonderful Portuguese map is still trying to reconcile everything. Here is Brazil, the New World, America, Africa, beautifully represented, India, Southeast Asia, but maybe it's still connected down here. And this will be the land of the South, the Austral land, Cook's Australia. But we're not quite sure. And then watch what happens between 1520 and 1522, a Portuguese captain in Castilian service in the next, Fernando de, Magalha, Fernando de Magalhães, as the Portuguese pronounce his name, Magellan, survived by his lieutenant, Sebastiano Elcano. He moves this way, and he opens the whole world. All the oceans are connected. This is the next revolution of the human mind. So we'll, we'll stop with that map and end with a few mythological pictures. Next. What was that for? Okay. Okay. <laughs> and here, the Portuguese and the tapestry weaver imagine the king and queen of Calicut as Christians. The first Portuguese, Vasco da Gama, and his men are absolutely convinced that the king of Calicut is a strange kind of Christian, but he must be a Christian. After all, unlike Jews and Muslims, they have statues just like we do. And in fact, the ship's board, uh, the, the writer of the log, says the saints in this country are very strange. They have many arms. <laughs> also, the priests, in unwelcoming us, anointed us with a mark on our forehead. They have been separated from us for so long that their rights differ but they are really Christians. After all, they have some kind of a trinity. And here, the, the, the weaver of the tapestry has imagined the gift of the king of Calicut to the queen of Calicut to the king of Portugal. Do you see it? The unicorn. The unicorn returns. The Christian mission will be fulfilled. Between this tapestry, finished in about 1500, and the next picture, drawn in 1515, you will see us leave the mythological world. Watch. The Indian <laughs> rhinoceros. The, king of, the Sultan of Gujarat 
sent this as a present to the Portuguese in 1514. This is the real unicorn. The poor animal went all the way, well, magic horn after all. It, it went all the way to Lisbon, where everybody in Europe who could travel to Lisbon went to gawk at it. Drawings were distributed, and Albrecht Dürer up in Germany made this version of that drawing. Then the Portuguese king decided to make a present of this rhinoceros to the pope, so the poor animal went into the Mediterranean on a galley, sailed up, and made a first stop at Marseille in the French kingdom. And any Frenchman who could get down to Marseille came to see the rhinoceros, the real unicorn. Then the animal was transported across the Gulf of Genoa to be disembarked at Genoa. But in the Genoese Gulf, a storm caused the ship to capsize and sink. And in 1515, the Indian rhinoceros went down to the bottom of the Mediterranean. It's a very sad story. But anyway, this, we're, watch the next one. This is the first Indian drawing of the Indian Trinity. Their first, un, the very early 16th century understanding, they're not Christians after all, though we would like to ally ourselves with them. But they still have a trinity of some kind. And the Portuguese artist is getting it almost right. You've got Brahma, and he's mixed up Vishnu and Shiva. This should be Shiva with the trident. This should be Vishnu, but he's got them mixed up. But you're beginning to get some kind of accuracy. And I'd like to conclude with this wonderful picture of the cultural mix. Next. This is Indo-Portuguese art produced in the Portuguese port of Goa in India, which the Portuguese fortified as of 1510, as it became their base in the Indian Ocean. And you can see the very Christian motif here. You know, it's a, a Santissimo Sacramento, Luvado, uh, Sia. May the most holy sacrament be uh, lauded. And with all these Christian and, and Solomonic symbols, you will see here Indian-looking characters and the great bird of the Indian Ocean carrying elephants in its claws. <laughs> and we'll conclude on this wonderful synthesis of all the cultures in Portuguese India. Thank you. So late, we're going to dispense with the questions. Would you take a couple just private sure, ones down here? Sure, if someone sure. wants to come down and chat with him, he's willing to stay for a few minutes. But it's very, very late. Sorry. But I'm sure you realize it was worth every minute of it. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs>